Hello everyone and welcome back to Video Editing 1 with Professor Harris. Today we're going through MC 110, Lesson 5, Cutting and Recutting a Scene. As you've seen, editing is all about revision. For many editors, finishing a sequence marks the beginning of the review, recut, and repeat process. As review notes and requests from the director, producer, or client stream in, the editor needs to break down each perfectly cut sequence and modify it and at times rebuild it entirely. So even though you think you're finished, even though you've got what you believe to be a final version, it's very rare that it will be the final version. The director, the producer, the client, they're always gonna have some kind of input and want some kind of change. It is a rare occurrence where that doesn't happen. So be prepared to continue editing, even when you think you're done. In this lesson, you'll learn the tools and techniques that will let you approach the rough cut and the inevitable recut with efficiency. Let's look at some of the goals for this lesson. Our goals for this lesson are to cut together and recut a dialogue scene, use a sequence as source material, navigate with time code, copy content between sequences, create subsequences, and use a match frame, find bin, and defined tool. All right, let's get into it. Reviewing core editing tools. So during the MC 101 course, you learn the core editing tools, splice in, overwrite, lift, and extract. And you work with them briefly to cut together a scene from the film called Jacuzzi. Or if you're one of my students, you recently used um, those tools, obviously, to compose your first assignment, your first project. A simple way to speed up the cutting process is to become proficient with these tools, obviously, especially the keyboard hotkeys. I'm going to drive this home. So is Avid. Get proficient with the hotkeys. And the three-point editing process. That's why we're reviewing these tools at a deeper level. So let's start with splice in and overwrite. To kick off our editing tool deep dive, let's if, see if you remember the difference between splice in and overwrite. I have a little bit of an exercise here. Let's see if you can identify or match up the following tools and their functions here on this, uh, this matching exercise. I'll give you a second. Okay, so obviously splice in is gonna be A, Insert new material into the sequence, moving downstream content forward in time to the right. And then overwrite is going to be B, replaces existing material or filler, and no downstream content moves forward in time. Did you get that right? Hopefully you did. Um, if you didn't, that's okay. We can keep reviewing this as we get deeper into this, uh, this, this lesson. Cool. So do you remember, though, how to perform a splice in an overwrite? Edit. Let's see. Uh, so then we'll run through the steps. First, for our splice in and overwrite, we're going to load and preview a clip in our source monitor. Once so we could load up a clip. Um, let's see here. Once our clip's loaded up, we could figure out what we want to use from this clip. We could set our in, and we could set our out. So let's see. So they run into each other. Was that was that a bad take? Yeah, that was a bad take. I will start here. We'll set in, run into each other, and she bends down to get the books. We'll stop there. So now we've got our in and our out set, and uh, we can prepare for the three-point edit. If necessary, we can patch the source and record tracks. So we can make sure that we're set to our, our V1, our A1, or if we wanted this to be some kind of cutaway, we could set it to our V2, and we could set our audio to an A2 if that was a, a second audio track. Um, I think we'll just leave it uh, on the main here just for now for clarity um, and simplicity's sake. All right, and then for splice in, we'll enable the appropriate tracks to maintain sync. Um, and then we'll press the V key or the B key on our keyboard. So let's find where we want to actually drop this. If I wanted to insert this shot and move this content downstream, I would V on my keyboard. You can see that shot gets added here. If I wanted to overwrite the existing content in my timeline, I would hit B on my keyboard. And that would overwrite the content that was there previously. Again, that's V for Victor and B for Benedict. So V is going to move content downstream. B, Benedict, is going to move, is going to overwrite content, and nothing is going to move downstream. All right, awesome. And then all we have to do is repeat this process over and over and over again until we've got ourselves a sequence. We could even be doing this on top of other clips in our timeline. So if I hold Command on my keyboard, it's going to snap to the last frame in this video. I can hit V on my keyboard. It's going to add it to the end. I could load another shot in my timeline. I could hit B on my keyboard, add another shot if I wanted to. Um, I think the ideal tool for this, if you're going to keep stringing out your sequence, is just hitting V on your keyboard because that's going to um, use that splice and overwrite, and it's going to move 
It's going to add that content right here at the end. Awesome. Does this workflow seem familiar to you? It should, because those are the steps we followed to build the jacuzzi sequence uh, back in MC101. So if you've been using the drag and drop method consistently, following this workflow will help make it feel natural. Thankfully, the when building our rough cut, it's repetitive, so it makes this doable. So we're going to keep doing this over and over again, and we're not going to forget how to do these uh, different things. Obviously, I'm using footage from different uh, projects, um, but you should be, when you're working through the exercises, you should be using the appropriate uh, media. I'm just using this as an example now. All right, developing three-point editing proficiency. When adding material to a sequence, you will use three-point editing most of the time. Even with the drag and drop method, you set in and out, which is two marks in our source monitor, and to, then to define the portion of the source clip to include, we're going to then use the third point, and that's where we're going to drop the material in the timeline. Editing with splice in an overwrite adds an essential speed and flexibility element to this process, especially if you commit to using the keyboard hotkeys. So what specifically is three-point editing? It's setting a combination of three in and out points before splicing or overriding a clip into a sequence. That is, where and how you set the marks depends on the edit at hand. Example would be editing a line by editing line by line, um, inserting a shot between two shots, or adding cutaways. Since you'll cut together and recut a narrative scene during the lesson five exercises, let's use that to uh, explain some three-point editing scenarios. First example would be line by line editing. So when you cut together a sequence in order, a linear fashion, you add each shot one right after the other. So similarly to how I was just doing it here, I'm just loading clips into my timeline, setting the material that I want, and then hitting V on my keyboard, and that's just adding more content to the end of my timeline here. Um, but uh, you'll mark the in and out, the source monitor, select our source content, um, or character lines, depending on what we're looking for. And then you can use the position indicator as a third point by placing it at the end of the sequence, like I just did. In fact, once you splice in or override a clip, Media Composer automatically places the position indicator at the end of the sequence. So if I hit V on my keyboard here again, we can see that playhead goes right to that last frame. So it's prepared for me to add another, thing, another uh, shot from my sequence directly to my timeline. It knows that that's probably what I'm going to want to do next. Um, cool. So which edit function do you use for this? Splice in or overwrite? I talked about you could use either essentially, but the correct way would be to use either. You can use either the splice in or the overwrite feature because there is no downstream content to mess up here. I could hit B on my keyboard. That's going to add the content. I could hit V on my keyboard. That's also going to add the content. And it's just at the end of my sequence. So I don't have to worry about messing anything up when it comes to that. Awesome. Hopefully that seems straightforward, um, but let's add on to that by moving now into the insert edits. At some point, you'll need to cut uh, need to cut a shot between two timeline segments. How how do you do this? How do you set this up? Once again, you'll set your in and out marks on our source track. So we're going to pick our shot. We're going to go, mm, yes, very nice. Um, maybe we'll pick. Oh yeah, media offline. Um, we'll pick our shot. We'll go. Mm, we want we want this. We want the beginning of his head turn the end of his head turn so we know what we want but we need to put it between these two shots how do we accomplish this well and which function are we going to use so if i want to put it between these two shots am i going to use splice in or am i going to use overwrite splice in if i use splice in then this downstream content will move over so that when i place this shot in the middle it's actually going to go in between these two shots if I use overwrite, it's going to use this as an anchor point and then overwrite the media that's already here. So it's just going to plaster on top of. So let's uh, park our position indicator where we need it to be. So I'll hold command and I'll use my position indicator and it's going to snap right to that exact frame so I don't create any flash frames by trying to eyeball it and get this right where it needs to be. You can just hold command and it'll snap to or control. And then once I have my in and out set in my source monitor, I'm going to hit V Victor on my keyboard to splice in between these two shots. Boom, we can see now I've spliced this shot in between both these other shots in my timeline. Very simple. We could do this anywhere else too. I'll probably do this, let's do this somewhere a little more familiar. Um, so let me hold command, and if I wanted to add a shot between these two shots, 
I set my marks on my source monitor, and all I have to do is hit V on my keyboard, and that's going to add that shot in between. Now, there is no audio to this shot, um, that's why it's only splicing in video, but it's also making a gap in my audio because I have my blue audio source track selected. Let me undo this. If I didn't select my audio source patch, or my, my audio track, and I added it, um, this is what happens. It places it in, and it breaks sync with this shot, right? We're now messing this up because this content has moved downstream and this content has stayed still. And we get this little notifier here on the bottom right that our this sync has been broken between these two shots by 107 frames. So I'm going to undo that and make sure that my the correct tracks are selected. So when I hit V, the downstream content that's associated with each other moves together at the same time. All right, so that's just some quick review there. Um, if you're wondering, yes, you can insert a shot into the middle of an existing clip, a common technique for uh, highlighting drama in a scene. So if I wanted to, I could park my position indicator really in the middle of this shot, make sure the clip select the correct tracks are selected, then I'll hit V on my keyboard, and that's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to splice that shot into the middle, and it's going to move that content downstream. Um, alternatively, if I wanted to do this and I wanted to add a cutaway, um, let's say I did have audio on this clip as well. Let me undo that. What I could do is come up here to my V2 track, and I could just put this on my V2 track, but make sure that my V1 and my A1 are selected. So if I hit, if I hit, um, I could hit B on my keyboard, and that would add it to my, my V2 track, or I could hit V, and that's going to add that as well. So now I got that, that uh, it's going to cut to a different shot. If I wanted to just have a cutaway here, I could hit V, or not V, Excuse me. I could deselect my my V1 and my A1 tracks, and I could hit B on my keyboard. And now, as we scrub through, this turns into a cutaway. This could be a reaction shot. This could be really anything. It could be I could be react. I could have a shot of someone reacting to what was said in this main timeline, and a cutaway now to what that looks like. And then it'll return right back to my sequence, because again, making sure this is selected, we have that top down view. All right, uh, and then. When we're cutting together an interview scene, or we want to show, not tell, right? Um, you can break up and go back and forth between talking heads by cutting away to another shot and then cutting back. You did this in the MC 101 course when you worked with the rock climber interview. Scene cutaways or reaction shots replace video while the person continues to talk. You often perform these video only edits as video only edits. Um, again, so this is a video only edit. I've added this to a second track, so this is working as my cutaway right now. All right, so what is the three-point editing setup for this? I kind of just showed you, but we'll do it again. Um, uh, and which are we gonna use here? Are we gonna use splice in, or are we gonna use overwrite, or does it matter? With the three-point edit setup, setup depends on the content priority. So here's how. Um, cutaway content priority, we're gonna set an in and out mark in our source monitor. Let's move over here. Let's move to this area now. We'll uh, we'll add our, our our little cutaway shot here. Uh, so we're going to select the content that we want to add from our source monitor. Maybe we want to get a shot of her face. So let's get I don't know. We'll just snag something. We'll snag something from here because she's a little bit closer to the camera. So we'll set in, come a little bit closer, and once she gets jump scared, we'll set an out and we'll hit uh, hit O on our keyboard. We got an in and out set. We've uh, specified what we want from the source monitor. And then um, we're going to set an out in our timeline to set where we want that cutaway to start or end respectively. So we can use um, this setup if you need to, to cut away to specific actions. So I could use an in or an out here to add this now shot that I've got here up here in my, uh, my source monitor. So I'm going to patch this back to my V1. And we're gonna we're gonna add a cutaway now directly in our V1. If I set an in, that means gonna that I want this shot to start at the in point and then go to the out point. So now with this situating situation, I'm gonna use the overwrite. So I'm gonna hit B on my keyboard, and that's gonna overwrite this shot. So now we've got this new added shot in our sequence, and boom, she gets jump scared. Um, this isn't actually chronologically correct with the scene, but you see what I'm trying to do here. Um, additionally, we could use the out mark. So I could come over here and I could put the out key and clear my in key by hitting D on my keyboard. Um, now I have my out, and what it's going to do is it's going to add the shot from the, from the back end. It's going to add the shot and make sure that the shot ends at this point. So I've hit B on my keyboard, 
it's going to add it from the out. Now we can see that this shot ends exactly where I've asked it to by using out on my keyboard. And so I'll do that and I'll clear my marks G. Cool. Hopefully that's making a little bit of sense. Um, you can add cutaways multiple ways. I could also be doing this on my second second uh, track here. So if I came up to my V2, I could be doing the exact same thing where I add an in and then it, I'm telling Media Composer I want to add it from this in point and I hit the overwrite button, which is B on my keyboard and that adds that cutaway to that second track. Um, and this is working a little less destructively because now I've got the cutaway. I've got the exact same cutaway. I've got the audio that I wanted originally. Or sorry, I, I had audio. I'd have the same audio that I wanted originally. I would just have a different uh, angle for this shot. So she's walking, she's walking, boom, we're cutting to a different shot of her walking, she's creeping up in the corner and she gets jump scared. Um, alternatively, I could trim this clip. So now, you know, she gets jump scared at a different point. But anyway, make it make sense for yourself. Um, do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> essentially. Okay, sequence content priority though. We'll set an in and out marks in the timeline to pinpoint the narrative content, the cutaway that needs to be covered. So we'll set an in or out in the source monitor to identify the cutaway start or end point. So transversely, so what we did before, we set ins and outs in our source monitor. We said we want this content as our cutaway to go here. What you could do instead is you could set an in and an out in your timeline. And then you could come up here to our source monitor, clear our marks with G, and I could set an in and say, okay, well, I want an in here, and it's only gonna add the exact same amount of material to this, this area, but from this endpoint. So it's gonna use this space, it's gonna use that space to dictate and tell Media Composer how much to grab from this area. So now if I hit B on my keyboard, it's gonna add that content from this endpoint forward that's going to match the duration that I've set between my in and outs in my timeline here. So we've accomplished essentially the same thing, um, just a slightly different method. So we could be inverting the way that we do our three-point edits. So we could set two marks in here if we wanted, one mark out here, or we could set two marks out here, and then one mark in here, and it's all relevant. Okay. All right, I hope that all makes sense, and we're going to keep moving. Um, did you guess the overwrite for performing these edits. Um, if you did, that's great. Um, you can use either function. If we wanted to, we could use the splice in, just making sure that the the additional tracks were, weren't selected. So let me undo that. So let's say I did have these tracks selected and I did hit uh, splice in. We can see it's moving that content downstream. But with this example, I'd want, I'd want the video there's no audio. I'd want the, the audio and the video to stay synced, and I just want that cutaway. If I deselected these tracks and hit V on my keyboard, that would that would add it appropriately up here. But then we end up uh, moving some other content downstream as well. So there are options. There are different ways to do it. But as far as adding cutaways, you're probably going to want to use a V2 track, and you're going to use that overwrite, um, that overwrite edit. You can use that three-point editing too. Cool. Notice um, each of the three-point edit examples, regardless of how and where you set the marks, uses three marks total. So that's why we call it three-point editing. What if you set four marks or no marks? Here's what happens. If you set four marks, so let's set two in our timeline, or sorry, our source monitor, and we'll set two in our timeline. So we've got two set now, one, two, one, two, or three, four, I should say. Um, and in and out in the source monitor plus an in and out in its sequence or timeline. Media Composer ignores the source monitors out and the timeline mark defines the edit duration. So if I hit B now on my keyboard, Media Composer has ignored the source monitors out. It's going to ask you this question multiple times and it will ask you this question when you're taking the AVID um, specialist certification exam. So be aware of that. All right, now, if you use zero marks, so let's hit G, we'll select our appropriate monitors. I'll clear my marks here. I'll be in my timeline. I'll hit G here as well. Um, so now I have no marks set. If you set zero marks in the source monitor or timeline, Media Composer uses the source and record side position indicators as in marks. It splices or overwrites the source content from the position indicator to the end of the clip into the sequence at the timeline's position indicator location. So what did that mean? 
Um, that means this position indicator is now our in. This is our in, and the end of this clip is our out. That's Those are our two points. And then our third point is wherever our playhead or our position indicator is in our timeline. So if I hold Command, I come here, and I hit V on my keyboard um, while also selecting this track and this one, it's going to splice in this shot from this point to the end right in between these two clips. So I'm going to hit V, Victor, and boom, it does exactly that. And I have it patched to my V2, that's why it, it went up to my V2. But that's that's how it works with this. So we have one, two, position indicator, and the timeline is three. Cool. Does this make sense? If so, that's great. If not, um, you use three-point editing during all three exercises in this lesson. Please do those. Um, as you know, hands-on experience leads to greater understanding. If you're not working in the program, if you're not uh, constantly playing around with these features and messing with them yourself, you're not going to get it. A quick nuance with the three-point editing, though, and overwrite. If you set in and out marks in the timeline and do one of the following in the source monitor, so here are two things. Mark it in near the end of the clip so the duration from the end to the clip's last frame is shorter than the timeline's in and out duration. So let's say I set an in and out in my timeline. I'll set in, I'll set an out. We have a pretty significant chunk of time here, but if I come over here to my source monitor and I set in and then I have my out, it's very, very close, and then I think I'm gonna try and splice in between these two shots here in my timeline, it's not gonna work. Insufficient source material to make this edit. So I don't have enough material from this point to the out to fill this gap that I've tried to create in my timeline. It's not gonna work. Um, additionally, we could mark an out near the beginning of a clip and do the same thing. So if I marked an out here and I didn't have enough material at the, from here from the beginning of my clip to the end, to try and fill this spot, I'm going to get the exact same message, insufficient source material to make this message. Cool. All right, and then the way we'd fix this is we could just decrease this distance um, of our cutaway shot. Um, so we could G on our keyboard, and we could make this much smaller distance, and then we'd have a, a greater chance of actually accomplishing this edit, whatever it may be uh, when it comes to our ins or our outs. Cool. Okay. You could also perform a fit to fill edit to fix this. So if we had insufficient source, so let's say I wanted this clapper shot, I I had a larger region set uh, in my timeline, I wanted this clapper shot to be stagnant, I could use that fit to fill uh, motion effect edit that we learned earlier um, to, to fill that gap. It would add extra frames and, and, and run this distance. Um, so, uh, and that's an option that we'll explore later more in, in Lesson 9 too. So to wrap up the three-point editing, uh, let's look at maintaining sync, a key component, obviously, of our editing workflow. So maintaining sync. As you know, maintaining sync, uh, the sync relationship between picture and sound is a basic editing requirement. You have to maintain sync, otherwise you're building garbage. Like any yellow function, remember yellow is what we need to be careful about, breaking sync. Splice in ripples downstream material in the sequence and therefore can break sync. To maintain, maintain sync between picture and sound, you'll always edit tracks with synced audio and video equally. So we're always gonna make sure, let me clear out my marks here and, and patch to the correct things. Um, we're always gonna equally uh, make edits to, to our content in the timeline. This includes having our link selection toggle on and when we, we select a clip to trim, we're making sure that it's trimming both the video and the audio associated with it. Um, so I'm not messing up my timeline and destroying my sync, uh, specifically the yellow ripple trim. So and we can see I've got all this handle I can use to make this longer or shorter. Uh, as you can see on my screen here, my V1 and my A1 tracks are active and both the source and record tracks are set to my V1 and my A1 as well. To maintain sync, we're gonna pay close attention to our track selectors at all times. That's just kind of a given across the entirety of Avid. But what if you want to insert an MOS or a video only shot in the V1, but their synced uh, sound on the A1 further down the timeline, um, how would you set up the track selectors? So let's say for instance, oh, didn't mean to do that. Let's say for instance, let's scroll down over here. Um, let's, uh, how do we want to do this? Let's, Hmm. Let's remove this 
and we got filler there. Um, I could deselect my tracks, and let's say I had, let me drag select some of this content. Do as I say, not as I do. Um, so let's say I wanted to splice in some content here at the beginning, but I didn't want to mess up the sync, but I did want to add video, a video cut um, here in my timeline with my splice in. We're gonna, we're gonna review that now. So if you set up your track selectors like I have here, we could hit our TC1 and we could deselect our A1 and our, our A1 source. Now we're only gonna add video, like I said earlier. Um, and it's going to add that shot here in our timeline. So let's set some track, let's set some points here in my, my source monitor. Like I said, my in and out, now in my in and out, when I hit V or B on my keyboard, um, it's gonna set, but we can see it's breaking sync with, with the audio that we had set there prior. So I'm gonna use overwrite in this instance to add that material without breaking sync between these two, um, the, the audio and the video clips here further downstream. Now, obviously I grabbed too much content because it over, did overwrite of the content that was here. But if you're trying to maintain sync, you need to pay close attention to your track selectors. Tracks matter. Be sure to always glance at your track selectors before you perform any edit. You might be wondering if you could use the sync locks and ignore the track selectors when using the splice in to insert content. Overall, the answer is yes, you can use these sync lock buttons to prevent that kind of damage happening to your timeline. That said, um, Avid recommends using the sync locks only as a safety net. Um, edit as if they're not on. You should always be editing as if they aren't enabled. As you edit, you may need to disable them to, cr uh, to create a particular cut and then forget to turn them back on. So if you forget to turn them back on, you should always be working um, as if they are disabled. If you develop good track selection habits, you'll encounter fewer problems while cutting and recutting or refunding a sequence. So far in this section, as we have emphasized splicing and overriding clips into the sequence, at the end of exercise four, you're gonna create a, uh, at the end of exercise four, you created a string out sequence for anesthesia. You can use that string out um, as a source going forward. All right, let's move on now to cutting from a string out sequence. So as you learned in lesson four, instead of having to constantly load clips from the dailies bin into the source monitor, you can create a string out of the dailies and review all the clips at once. Plus, you can cut shots from the string out into the main sequence. So to splice in or overwrite from the string out sequence, we can drag the sequence from its bin and drop it into the source monitor. Let me say that again very slowly because this is very, very cool. We can drag a sequence from a bin and drop it into our source monitor. That means a whole sequence, a whole edited sequence. So let me open my sequences bin I'm gonna drag and drop this string out sequence into the bin, and then boom, we've loaded an entire edited sequence into our bin. Now, I, it's a jumble of shots because I'm always working horribly, but um, I've got I've got a whole a whole timeline almost essentially, a whole sequence loaded into my source monitor. Very cool. We can set our in and out marks to prepare for a three point edit. So we could say, hmm, from this entire sequence, I want this nerd clear till she bumps into the doctor for some reason because this makes so much sense um so now we have we've selected a bunch of clips essentially but we've selected them just by loading that that whole sequence into the source monitor and if you add a time code burn in effect on our our string out sequence we could remove that later we don't have to do that now because they didn't add one on this string out all right, we can double check our track selectors for patching. Um, so let's turn off the ones that are kind of, well, no, we can keep them all on, um, but let's figure out where we're gonna put this. Let's splice it in between here. So we're gonna put this whole sequence in between this area here. Um, I got my A1, my A2, my V1. Okay, and then all we have to do is press V or B on our keyboard because we have our set in and out marks and we have our third position set here. So I'll just hit V. And boom, that's going to add the entire sequence from there clear into my, my timeline. So now I've got from here, clear over, is the whole sequence as it appeared in the string out sequence. So if I double click the string out sequence, I'll load the string out sequence into my timeline. And we can see this is the region that I've selected from that string out sequence. If I go back to my anesthesia v1 project, we can see it's all here as well. So that's really, really cool, really cool feature. Um, editing from a string out sequence can save a lot of time, especially if you use 
the toggle source record monitor and the timeline feature. If you plan to use this feature frequently, you can consider mapping it to your keyboard or command palette. So what is Avid Media Composer saying there? What it's saying is essentially, if when I load that sequence into my, my monitor here, what I could do is I can select my toggle source record. And when I do, I can see what's going on in this sequence. And then I could make adjustments to this. Let's say on my V2 track, I did have a time code burn in. I could remove that so that when I do uh, flip this back to, and then you set my endpoints and then add it to my timeline here in my anesthesia V1 project, that it's not including that time code burn in. I could make those edits directly um, by flipping my toggle source record. So super, super cool. All right, awesome. Okay, of course, as you build your sequence, you'll eventually need to remove content. So let's review uh, two content removal functions that we'll use to do this uh, hyper efficiently. Uh, and these two functions are called the lift and extract, and we used these before. Lift and extract complement splice in and overwrite. We briefly explored this in uh, lesson three of the MC 101 course, um, and I'm wondering if you remember how they work. I really hope that you do. Um, let's see if you do by uh, completing this quick matching exercise. So go ahead and match the correct functions to their definitions. Okay, so we've got extract. Which one is extract? That's right, it's B. It removes content in and out, closing the gap by moving downstream clips back in time to the left. So if you remove something, it's gonna snap that shut. And then lift is gonna remove content between an in and out marks and leaves a filler gap. Yeah, so no clips move, it stays the same. So it just lifts it out of the timeline and a hole is left behind. Cool. Um, did you identify these two functions correctly? If so, great. If not, you will in time and with practice. So to sum up, you'll use the left lift when you need to maintain a sequence's duration or picture and sound synchronization. It's the inverse of overwrite. So overwrite, we plaster over things. With lift, we remove. So if I set an in, and I come over here, and I set an out in my timeline, and then I lift, if I use this little icon, or if I hit... Um, X, sorry, Z on my keyboard, that's going to lift that content. It's going to remove it. It's going to make a hole. It's going to leave a hole behind. Now we have this lovely void. Um, but my sequence stayed exactly the same length. If I undo this and now I remove it with extract by hitting X on my keyboard or this little scissor icon here, boom, all the content downstream closes the gap. And uh, if we accidentally select the wrong thing, so let's say I select, if I deselect my A1, and I hit extract, boom, we've just, we've just broken sync. Now our whole project, everything downstream is destroyed and it's your fault. Um, so I'm gonna do that with command Z or control Z, but remember that um, our lift and extract functions, lift is red in quotes and uh, extract is yellow. Yellow is obviously the one that's more likely to break sync. Although you can break sync with both um, if you really tried. Okay, so you use the extract function though, uh, when you need to remove content and close the gap left behind by its removal. Um, again, we know I just taught you how to lift and extract, so we don't need to review that again, but it's pretty pretty straightforward, right? We're gonna set our marks in our timeline. We're gonna choose what we want to remove. I could hold command, snap to this position, snap over here, hold command, snap, hit my out, or transversely, if I wanted to remove specifically this clip and its associated audio clip, um, what I could do is clear my marks. If I just hit T on my keyboard, if I deselect tracks that have empty filler on them and I hit, excuse me, if I deselect everything because I'm mad, um, let me turn back on the appropriate tracks. If I, why is it still all selected? Oh, gee, excuse me. If I hit T on my keyboard, it's going to select specifically that track. Make sure you're selecting the correct tracks. If I hit, if I had activated my V2, it would have set in at the very beginning and, and out at the very end because it's assuming that I want to select this track itself, uh, but that's not what I want to do. I want to select what's beneath it. Cool. So watching your track selectors, again, uh, if you wanted to pick a specific clip to remove, make sure you have the appropriate track selected, and then you hit T on your keyboard, that's going to automatically set that in and out, and then I could hit X to remove it or, or extract it, and that's going to close the gap, or I could hit Z, and that's going to lift it and leave it empty, leave a blank space behind.
Okay, before we continue, i uh, make a quick apology here for the audio change. I ended up having to move locations to finish recording the rest of this lesson. So if the audio is different, again, my apologies. All right, let's move into another Avid tip. It's a technique. So using extract to compress time with jump cuts. As you move past fundamental editing techniques, you'll develop creative ways to use the editing tools uh, and add impact to a sequence. For example, you can extract to cut down a long shot into a series of jump cuts. This is not subtle. It's not a subtle technique, but it works great for high energy advertisements, sports promos, montages, and so on. So this works well with the subject moving towards the camera. For example, a running athlete or a moving a car. Um, each jump cut moves the subject significantly closer to the viewer. To archive this, uh, you can cut a long segment into a sequence, then mark and extract multiple sections from that segment. So um, we would get that cool editing effect. Um, I won't do that now, but if you'd like to, you can go ahead and attempt to do that um, by yourself. Let's move on now to working with timecode. In Media Composer, you can use timecode to navigate to a specific point in a clip or sequence, track in and out durations, and so much more. At times, you'll want to track multiple timecode details, for example, Eclipse source timecode, its total duration, and the duration between the in and out marks. That's why you selected Always Display Two Rows of Data in the Composer settings during Exercise 4. I clearly don't have that set now, so if I right-click in my Composer window and come down to Composer Settings, I can select under Data Display at top. We can do Always Display Two Rows of Data, and then click OK. Now we have two rows of data that we can work off of. Uh, these data fields can display the clip name, duration, time code, and slash or film tracking data in the broad range of views. Okay, to better understand some things going forward, I added a quick time code burn in. Um, the way that I did that is I just took my blank V2 filler track, I went to the effects palette, and under generator I added the time code burn in, boom, automatically adds it. Super easy. Um, but let's continue. So. Um, to change what's displayed as far as our time codes uh, up here at the top of our, our uh, composer window, we can first uh, we can click first the first or second row time code display. Um, so we could pick one of these. So it'd be very nice. We could pick this one. We could pick the top one. We could pick the record side. We could pick the second record side. And then we have these three different sections. We have this first section, the second section, and the third section. And I'm going to explain each one of them now. So uh, we're going to select an option from one of the first from one of the three sections that appear. So first we have source data type, so in the source monitor, and then sequence data type in the record monitor or none. So sequence source none. Uh, the second area we have the source time code option. So this is the source monitor or the sequence time code option for the record monitor. So we've got all all the different bits there. And then in the last area, we have source track options available for both the source and record monitor menus. So depending on which one we're selected on, we're going to see uh, different different values and different information. So when I switch here, we can see we have our source tracks in our record monitor. This includes our V2, our V1, and A1, and A2. But when I click again in my source monitor, we have our V1 and our A1 because that's all that appear down here. Perfect. Uh, let's move now. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at the three sections. So. First, in section one, let's select this. I'm collect selecting the bottom half of the uh, of this second row. Um, in the first section, uh, this tells me the composer how to display the information in sections two and three. So this dictates what's going to be shown here and here when we select this, as uh, as time codes and name clips or frames. In most cases, you'll want to display the time code because this is the time code. This is time code stuff. Uh, in section two, which is down here. This is our section. This is our second section. Um, this displays timecode information about a clip or a loaded sequence in the source monitor or a sequence in the record monitor. Timecode options include M for master. Uh, this uses the position indicator location to display the sequence's current timecode. This matches the green timecode displayed in the top left corner of the timeline window, which is down here. So this, this matches. These numbers match. Next, we have D for duration. This is going to make sense why I'm saying uh, the letters, because that's how it's displayed later when we're picking it in the menus. Um, duration displays the clip or sequence's entire duration. Easy peasy. We have in slash out or I and O. This displays the marked in to out duration. 
Then we have AB or absolute. This displays the time from the head of the clip or sequence to the position indicator. For example, 15 seconds if the position indicator is 15 seconds from the beginning of the clip. So it's just tracking that information. And then we have R for remaining or remain. This displays the time remaining from the position indicator to the end of the clip or sequence. So very diff very uh, similar to absolute when absolute's measuring from the front, from the distance to the position indicator. Uh, the uh, remain is measuring from the position indicator to the end of the clip or sequence. And then section three, which is down here, um, this lists information from each source clip track, source monitor, or source clip details based on the position indicator's location in the timeline or record monitor. Besides using uh, this display info menus um, and their, as references, you can use them to navigate to specific points in a clip or sequence. So if a director has a note that he wants to bring up, he could look at the time code burn-in. He could say a specific frame, oh, you know, one minute, one second, and 30 frames, there's a flash frame. And he could make that note, give it to the editor, and then the editor could punch in directly uh, in these time code values to get to that specific, that specific frame um, for very precise editing. So this is called jumping to specific time code. So after loading a clip or sequence into a monitor, we can go to the specific frame by typing in a time code. Let's look at how to do that if my second screen here would operate. Uh, to find a specific frame in our time code, we can ensure that the correct monitor or timeline is active. So for instance, we're going to find a specific frame in our timeline here. So we're going to be in our record monitor and we're going to be looking at our, our time codes in our record monitor. Ensure that the correct monitor or timeline is active. Yep, duh. And then if needed, you can call up the correct time code display for navigation. Uh, for source clips, we do source video V1 time code. For master clips, we would do the master TC1 time code. We're currently set to the master TC1 time code, time code one. Um, if we click this, we could change it though. We could come over here to sequences and then in frames, we could change it to the ins and outs, the absolutes. We could go to footage, we could go to time code and we could pick any one of these options as well. But right now with time code, we're set to our master time code. So we're gonna leave that the same. So we're our master TC1. Cool. And then we'll use a numeric keypad to type in a time code in hours, minutes, seconds, and frames, but we do not need to include the, uh, the zeros or colons. For example, a one hour, 23 minute, and two second clip is gonna be typed one, two, three, zero, two, zero, zero. That's all you have to type. And then you can press enter on your numeric keypad and it's gonna immediately jump to that position in the timeline. Awesome. So if you enable, this is a tip from Avid, if you enable the always display two rows of data composer settings, ensure that the top time code display shows the source V1 time code in the source monitor and that the master time code one in the record monitor is shown. So we would want the, the source V1, right now we have the source A1, so let's change that. We'll go source V1 uh, time code. And then we have our V1 time code one, and now that's set. So when I scrub this around, we'll see that that value change at the top. Right now, so I have the remaining frames. I could change this as well. Um, so I could come over here and we could do, hmm, let's see. We'll just leave it, we'll leave it as the remaining frames. Um, but then in our master, we have our master TC1 set. And if we wanted to change this as well, we could come down, we could go to frames and we could change it to in and out, absolute. We'll set it to in and out. And let's say I put an in my timeline and then out my timeline, that's going to have that exact number of frames. We have 1,537 frames between this distance here. Pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool. I'm going to deselect that, and we're going to keep moving here. Um, if you set this to another display option, for example, duration or in or out, some navigation features discussed in this section won't work. So if I have it set to my in and out, and I start trying to search um, for a specific time frame, um, the director is not going to know what in and out point that I have set right now. They're not gonna just magically infallibly know that. So this is gonna work as well, um, or at all, if we're trying to do this. So as you start typing, an entry field automatically opens in the number uh, of, in the middle of the monitor. So once we're up here and we know that we're selected, we got our time code stuff, um, we can see when I tap this, it changes in the middle of the monitor. But if I started typing a number, it's gonna start making adjustments and it's going to see 
that if we look at my left side of my screen, because I don't have a numeric keypad, um, my numbers right now are activating and deactivating my source and record tracks. But if I did have a larger keyboard, this would automatically um, change and then I could start typing in that code. Again, I don't have an extended keyboard, so I can't necessarily show you that option right now. Um, but Media Composer auto adds the colons again when you start typing. If the system beeps at you, and this is very important, Avid's going to ask you about this one. If the system beeps at you, this means that Media Composer can't find the specific time code value that you typed. So you'll have to double check that at the top uh, on your display info menu and make sure that the time code is correct. So if you type in a time code and hit enter on your keyboard and it goes beep, you're going to, you messed up, you screwed up. All right, another quick note here from Avid. If you're working on a laptop uh, or with a keyboard that does not have a numeric keypad, keyboard, um, that you know that's the extra numbers off to the side, quickly press the control or command on Mac key twice to open the entry field, then use the number keys at the top of your keyboard to enter a time code. So that's an option for you there as well. I have a quick note though, um, earlier when I was trying to switch or I was using the sequence and then coming to frames to change these uh, different time code things, all you have to do, and this is a faster way to do this, is you can just select it and then switch between this uh, second section here. So we could be switching to absolute frames and remaining frames. And that's a much faster way of, of, of navigating through all that. So you have options. All right, here are two more built-in time code entry shortcuts. If you're looking for a time code that starts with the same hour as the current time code, just type the last digits. For example, if the current time code reads, um, you know, 0, 1, 0, 5, 12, 13, which would be 1 hour, 5 minutes, 12 seconds, and 13 frames, you could simply just type um, 6, 0, 4, 2, 3, and then the position indicator is going to know that you're working within the same hour and it's going to jump to that one hour, six minute, four second, and 23 frame mark rather than having to uh, include that first that first couple uh, numbers to include it in the hour. The same approach works for uh, minute or second. For example, if the current time reads um, one hour, five minutes, 12 seconds, and 13 frames, you could type 3423. Uh, and then the position they can is going to jump to one hour, five minutes, 34 seconds, and 23 frames. So if you type a period, this is another quick tip, if you type a period, the system will add two zeros. For example, if I search for one hour, 21 minutes, and then I type in uh, zero, 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 I could just type 21 and then two periods, and that would add both those sets of zeros for me. So quick shortcuts when you're typing in those, those time codes. All right, awesome. Moving on and in a different project, just ignore that. Um, we're gonna go into typing a frame offset. So you can use Media Composer's frame offset feature to move a position indicator from its current frame forward or backward by a specific number of frames. To use the frame offset on a clip or sequence, make sure that the monitor with the clip or sequence is active. So we'll uh, use this source monitor clip and using the numeric keypad, so you have to have the numeric keypad for this feature, you're gonna press the plus key uh, to move forward and the minus key to move backward. Um, that plus and minus are just directional. The minus is gonna go backwards, plus is gonna go forward. Um, for some reason, Avid loves to ask questions about this. Plus is forward, minus is backwards. Um, and then you can uh, enter the number of frames for the offset by doing the following, you could type a number between 1 and 99. That's, again, representing frames. And then we could type the number uh, of 100 or more to move forward or backward by a specific number of seconds and frames. For example, 200 plus to move forward two seconds. Uh, with caps lock off, add a lowercase f to enter the frame counter greater than 99. For example, if you did plus 200 F to move forward 200 frames. So you could be doing that as well. Again, you're gonna have to press enter once you're done doing that. So very cool. Optionally, we could also press enter again and Media Composer will repeat uh, that last entry. So if you did go over, if you did go 200 frames and then just keep hinting enter, um, it's gonna keep doing that, that jump. But you do have to add the F at the end. Another small detail Media Composer wants you to know. Uh, you can also use the frame offset to mark a duration with one difference. Uh, to set an 
an accurate duration when moving the position indicator forward or backwards, um, type the duration minus one frame. Why? If you mark an in or out while parked uh, on the current frame, the center duration displays 0, 0, 1. Media Composer counts this frame. So if you mark an in and enter plus 100, the center duration displays 1 second and 1 frame dash 1 second plus the initial frame shown here. So we can see uh, through this image after you have you know entered uh, minus 300 on a numeric keypad, the center duration reads 3 colon 01. So you have to remember to remove that one frame when you're trying to get to that desired location. To set a desired duration, we can subtract a frame. For example, if we type 23 uh, in a 24p project. So if you work with a variety of frame rates and don't want to do the mental math, you can simply enter enter the duration that you want and then step back one frame before setting the in or out mark um, to step forward a frame before setting the in. I, I know that's, that sounds very confusing and it is a little confusing, but essentially what Media Composer is saying is that it's counting the frames, so you have to make sure that you're you're shooting just one shy. So when you set that in, it counts it counts that that subsequent frame. Um, so it can be selecting the proper region rather than including that one extra frame, and because you'll end up with flash frames. With that, um, if you want, I would highly recommend for this that you go do this exercise. It's in the book. Um, this is exercise five point one. So pause here, pause the video. Go into your book and, and execute this practice exercise so that you know exactly what I'm talking about here because you're going to be very confused if you don't. So do that on your own time. And we'll continue now to essential tools. So this section covers tools and features that boost efficiency while cutting and recutting a sequence. This includes the sequence duplication, go to next event and go to previous event, go to previous marker and go to next marker, and snapping to edit points. The MC101 course introduced you to some of these features that I just listed, but since they're essential to the workflow, we're going to continue to review them here. So first is duplicating a sequence. Throughout the editing process, you want to duplicate your sequences. We've talked about this before. Um, let's say a director reviews it and then you know wants you to go back and uh, re-edit the sound or add more effects. You're going to want to save that alternative version um, for later. So you would go to your sequences bin. Um, let me let me drag this out. I don't actually have. Do I not have any sequences? Oh no, I do. I have sequences here. Um, and to duplicate a sequence, all you have to do is select it and then hit Command D or Control D on your keypad, and that's going to make an identical name with the dot copy dot a one uh, name convention afterwards. So, duplicating is uh, especially your your sequences is extremely extremely uh, valuable. Cool. Um, you could also rename this. For instance, you could do. Uh, TN Parkour Montage Alternative Cut, um, and that's, again, being very clear. You could also do different versions, so this could be Parkour Montage Version 2, and uh, just being being extremely clear about what you're doing is going to be the, the best practice. Cool. Uh, we could also duplicate from, the duplicate from the record monitor. So if you're cutting a sequence and you're about to experiment with the alternative cut, you can preserve the current version, uh, and then keep working. To do this, we could right-click in the record monitor and then choose duplicate. And then that's going to, uh, in the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to, the select dialog box is going to pop up. It's going to ask us where we want to save this duplicated sequence. We could choose our sequences bin and we're going to get back to the exact same thing. Now we have a duplicate of our string out sequence. We can come back here. We could do string out V2 for reference. Or we could do string out original or whatever it may be. Okay. Awesome. So you'd use this method uh, during the next two exercises as well in the book. So if you're doing those, you'll be doing that there as well. We can also duplicate from the bin. I just showed you how to do that. Um, so that's super easy. Uh, but let's move on now to the go to next slash previous event buttons or event options. So during the MC 101 course and perhaps during this uh, during exercises in this course, you've used the go to previous event and go to next event um, to jump to the position indicator to jump that position indicator to the edit points in the timeline that looks like this we have these go to previous event go to next event buttons and 
right now, when I click this, it's jumping forward and backwards to the front and back of my, my entire sequence. That's because I have my V2 track selector selected. So it's going from the beginning of this filler to the end of this filler. You're going to make sure that you have irrelevant tracks deselected. So when I'm actually clicking this, it's going to jump to real points that make sense within our timeline um, and not all over the place like a crazy person. So this is super, super helpful. By default, these buttons or keys are mapped uh, and they respond to track selectors. So the position indicator stops only at the head frame for the edit points that appear on, all, on the active tracks. So if all tracks are active, the position indicator may only stop at the first or last frames like I just talked about. And you can, you can reprogram how these buttons respond. For example, you can use them to stop at keyframes or tail frames. You can program the stop them stop at every edit point regardless of active track selectors. So we can make it so it ignores with the V2. It's going to stop at every edit point rather than jumping from the beginning to the end. Uh, to set our go to previous and next events uh, to stop at every edit point, let's do the following. We're going to right click in our composer window, which is up here. We could really select either window or we could do the control plus equals or command plus equals. I'm just going to right click in my composer window uh, so I can see um, and then we'll come down to composer settings. And then here in composer settings, we're going to go to the move tab over here in the move tab. And then we can, when the composer or timeline is active, go to previous, sorry, go to next slash previous event commands, do the following. And we can set this to um, ignore track selectors so that it, it, it stops on every single um, edit point. We could also set it to stop at the tail frames if we wanted, or we could set it to stop at keyframes. This can be highly useful if you're trying to adjust um, um, non-real-time effects, maybe time warps and things like that. Um, but we're just going to, we're just going to keep rolling here so we can do ignore track selectors and that that's probably going to be the best way to go. Uh, we could also, um, with the audio mixer, when that's active, we could also use these event commands to do the following. We could make it ignore track selectors as well. Um, that's just another option if we wanted to do that. But we're going to go ahead and hit OK now and we're going to continue. So now if we hit the uh, go to next and previous event buttons on our keypad, um, with my, VT, my V2 track still selected, it's not jumping to the front and end anymore. It's jumping to every appropriate edit point or previous events, which is very, very nice tool. Uh, quick reminder, the button to or for the go to next and go to previous events are not mapped by default um, to our keyboard. So we should consider mapping those um, with the up and down arrow keys uh, or to our A and S keys on our keyboard. And in fact, I am going to do that right now. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. At least we're going to hit command three. We're going to open our command palette. And next we're going to go to file. And then in settings, under settings, we're going to go to user. And then in user, we're going to shrink some of these tabs so we can find our keyboard settings. Here's our keyboard. We're going to expand our keyboard and double click the one that we're actually using. And then we're going to move some of these tabs out of the way. We're going to make sure that our keyboard is directly beneath our command palette. And with our button to button reassignment selected, we can now uh, move these, we can now uh, map the functions that we want. Now, this is, I believe, let me find the correct buttons here. Go to previous, go to next event. There we are. Um, so what we can do is I'm going to actually, I'm going to put this on my alternate keyboard. Um, oh, wait, no, I should probably leave the group buttons there. Tell you what, we'll use the, I'm going to use my, air, my left and right arrow keys. So I'm going to drag and drop the go to previous. To on my left key, and I'm going to drop the go to next event on my right key, and now that's hard mapped to my keyboard um, and something I can easily select through. So I can close these windows, I can close my settings window here, and now when I just am I am, when I'm selected on my timeline, I can use my left and right arrow keys and I can jump to those head frames, and it's super easy, super fast, and I highly, 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 highly recommend doing this for yourself right now. Cool. All right, let's now go to uh, using the previous and next markers. So during lesson four, you worked with the markers. If you remember, we could go to tools, pull up markers, and then you're going to go, oh, yeah, these things. I know these things. These are fun. Um, so we could use this to go to next and previous markers in our timeline. I'm going to add a marker here just so that we have one. Beep, beep, beep. Hit OK. So now we have two markers in our timeline. We have one here and we have one there. Um, so. 
If you want to get, navigate to markers without clicking them or opening the markers tool, you could program to go to previous and next events to stop at markers. If you want to uh, reverse those buttons for navigating to edit points, um, you'll want to map those to go to previous marker and go to next marker buttons in the command palette's move tab uh, to your interface or keyboard. So that's another option. But I believe by default, if I hit A and S, I'm wrong. It is not auto mapped. Let me try Shift A and Shift S. No, that just turns on and off my segment mode. Oh well. Um, no, but you could map those buttons. Um, it shows on the keyboard in the book at least that they have it mapped to ANS um, by default. If I hit ANS here, it's it's not doing that. It's just changing trim modes and it's going to the beginning and the end. Let's try and disable this and see if. No, that's just yeah, that's just shifting. Uh, that's just shifting trim positions. Anyway, that's fine. Uh, yeah, feel free to map that for convenience. So let's say we were doing, we're going back through, we we're doing our big revision, and we wanted to easily jump between our different marked points. We could do that much more efficiently um, and be adding those effects or whatever it may be by using our A and S buttons on our keyboard. By the way, this jumps the position indicator to the next and previous marker, regardless of track selection. So that's a really nice feature. So if I had, you know, let's say, 30 tracks, 30 video tracks, and 30 audio tracks, I could add a bunch of markers, and no matter what, uh, it's going to ignore those track selectors, and it's going to be jumping to those, those markers in my timeline. All right, now let's talk about snapping to edits. The MC101 course introduced you to snapping to a segment's first or last frame in the timeline. This saves time if you want to jump ahead or back by several edits. Here's a recap on how to snap to edits. To snap the segment to the first frame, we can hold Control or Command, and then click near the beginning of a segment. So if I hold command and I click in my here, it's going to it's going to click right, it's going to snap directly onto that. Additionally, I could hold command while I'm dragging it and it's going to snap to those those head frames as well. So that's a really nice feature. Um, if we wanted it to snap to the last frame, we could hold option command or control command. Or sorry, control uh, what is it? Alt control and then that's going to snap to the tail frame. So this looks very similar, but if I hold Command, we can see it shifts slightly. If I hold Option, it's going to shift slightly again because we're going to the last frame of this video versus the first frame of the next video. Again, we're trying, we're doing this to prevent um, freeze frames. So you're going to make sure you're doing this when you're when you're doing that splice in editing specifically. So if I had this loaded in my source monitor and I had let's set an in, we'll set an out. If I just arbitrarily try and park this as close as I can to that that cut there, and I hit V. We're inevitably going to end up with flash frames somewhere. It's going to it's going to jitter somewhere, and it's going to look weird. Um, so I can undo that. Make sure I hold Command, and it's going to snap to the true head frame, or Command Option that'll snap to the tail frame. And then I can add I can hit V on my keyboard and know for sure that there's not going to be any flash frames here. Although it does look like there's some kind of flash frame here. Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, command is probably the preferred because you want to snap it to that head frame. So cool, very cool. Um, all right. Uh, alternate ways to use sequences. So self-taught editors often struggle to manage large projects because they try to do everything in one sequence. Cutting multiple scenes, replacing shots, adding new material, and trimming can feel daunting as an editor who worries about wrecking their sequences and all the good parts. If you have an extremely long sequence, that should be inducing, that should be giving you more anxiety when it comes to making uh, edits. So the more you can break up your sequences, the more you can break up your scenes, the better off you're going to be because you can be refining those to the best of their ability on an area that, that feels reasonable, something that's not too large, you know, um, minutes, not not hours, not, not in the double digits even. I mean, it depends on the scene, but try and keep it tight. Think of a sequence as a canvas. Starting a new one is like grabbing a blank sheet of paper to sketch out a new idea. And you don't need to worry about creating too many sequences as long as you organize them. So if you're organized, that's obviously the best course of action. Make a bazillion sequences, have a bazillion different versions, and even add columns to your sequences. Remember what I talked about with the quality, adding the custom uh, column, doing a new column, uh, add a new, adding a new custom column, and doing, uh, you just call it quality. Uh, and then you could be adding those asterisks. So if you have a version of the sequence that you like more, you could add three asterisks versus just two or one, you know, good, better, best convention. And then your 
you're staying organized and you're really working to the best of your ability. Um, I know as far as visual design goes, and this is a huge tip for you as video editors, that you're always going to have what the client wants and then you should always have a version that you created that you feel um, is best. Um, and that's not to say that you don't put the maximum effort on the client's desire or what the client wants, but a lot of people in the world of like media, they don't realize what they want until they see it. So if you can make what they want and then make your own version, that sets you apart instantly. The best in any field come prepared. And if you bring that second version uh, of your edit, which you are probably going to be more passionate about, you understand more about this field than they do, then you're going to, one, they're going to be thrilled, hopefully, and two, you're going to be happy because you felt like you satisfied the itch to make uh, make it better, make it its best. All right. But to keep sequences organized, we can follow these tips. You're going to keep your sequences in a dedicated sequence bin. So I have, I, for my students, um, and this is just the Avid Base project. This is this uh, TN parkour was given um, as a download. I've been putting all my sequences in here, and that helps me stay organized. But that's also where they put all their sequences. So keeping your sequences in one bin uh, per project and editing on a scene-by-scene -scene basis, that's going to be super, super helpful. Um, what else can you do? You can do name every sequence. This is a no-brainer. If you're not naming every sequence, you are you need to see help. You need to seek help. Um, and then number three is to use consistent naming conventions that include versions, numbers, or dates and times um, so that you can stay on top of when each version was made or how it was made or why is it different. Again, we could be doing this quality, uh, this different column, and uh, or you could even be doing dates. You could be typing in your dates. I mean, they already have a creation dates here, so we can see when each one of these were made. Um, and some of these were made clear back in 2021 because that's what Avid provided us for this course. So very cool. Thanks, Avid. Um, and next we have use the comments field in the text or script view to briefly note what's unique, changed, or being attempted with that sequence. So um, again, custom columns. Use your custom columns. Make custom columns. It's super easy. Add custom column. Boom. You type the name of it, and then you add it in the, uh, the text field underneath. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. All right. You've worked with duplicate sequences and string out. Now let's look at how to isolate portions of a scene or sequence by creating a sub sequence. So it can create a sub sequence to break up a scene or a sequence into shorter sections, turning each section into a discrete sequence. Basically, you're duplicating a portion of a sequence rather than the whole thing. And why would you do this? Well, there's several reasons why you might do this. Um, but I would say, firstly, is if you if you make an edit and you're like oh this part is perfect like this has the perfect emotional impact but the first feels flat maybe you want to save that back portion of the scene um to then revisit later so if you redid the first part or if you went back and reshot the first part you would still have the golden standard of that second half to reference to and then merge those those two different um those two different days that you filmed together now there's continuity errors with that like makeup and hair and all kinds of stuff um, and that's not your problem that's you're in post you're i mean that is kind of your problem everything's your problem when you're in post um, because everyone says oh we'll fix it in post and that's you you are post um, you are a post get over it but that's the nature of the position that's the nature of what you're doing anyway so that might be one reason you would make a subsequence but a subsequence can serve multiple purposes um, according to avid one is to isolate the program's opening and close for the use of multiple episodes. So you might have created a perfect opening sequence for uh, what, what do you call it? Intro. And then you have a nice intro and you want to save that. You could save that as a subsequence and boom, you have it for reference next time. Uh, to pull individual scenes from one version of the program into to use it in another version. So again, we have multiple edits. We might want to snag that and throw it into another one. And then the third reason is to separate out a problematic portion of a scene and then play with it without the risk of messing up our main sequence. So what isn't working about the scene? I could take it. I could make a new subsequence. That's that blank sheet mentality again. We're not messing up our main sequence. We're just re-editing a portion of the main sequence um, without damaging our overall workflow. All right, but to create a subsequence, we can load the sequence into the record monitor. So we've already got... Uh, our sequence here in the record monitor. So that's easy peasy. 
And then we can set in and out marks in the subsequence for the content that we want to grab. For this example, I'm going to grab the first half, essentially. So I'll hit out here. I'm going to come to the beginning. I'm going to set an in. Now I have the first half. Make sure that all my tracks are selected too. Um, so I'm grabbing every single bit of information from that. You don't have to do that. Maybe there's just, maybe you don't want to have to work with the audio or like the music while you're trying to edit this um, on your A2. You might not select that. That's fine. And then we can drag the sequence icon above the record monitor to a bin or alt drag or option drag the record monitor frame to a destination bin. So here my sequence has been, we saw my student lesson sequence bin open. I could hold option because I'm on Mac or alt if I was on Windows and I could drag this to a bin and that would make a subsequence. Additionally, I could just grab this little icon and I could do the exact same thing. So it's going to create that string out. B2, copy, <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, so it's got all this horrible name conventions, but um, stay organized. Do as I say, not as I do, again. Um, so now we've created a subsequence, and we could load this into our timeline. So I'm going to double-click this, and now we can see that this subsequence we created, that's everything we just grabbed. So now we have subsequence. We can edit this on a, a new sequence and know that we're not damaging our main our main string out sequence and our, T, our parkour or whatever it may be. Very fun stuff. Uh, when you load the newly created subsequence, you'll see that it contains the tracks that we selected and the in and out contact that we selected as well. Duh, no brainer. Uh, creating a sequence from a selection though. Alternatively, al excuse me, alternatively, you can use selected segments to quickly create a new sequence. To do this, we can select the segments in the timeline. So let's reopen back uh, our string out. Uh, was it string out V2? I think that's where we were. And I'm going to clear my marks, G. All right, um, so we could just select segments for this. So we'll select the segments in the timeline that we want to include in our new sequence. We could use the lasso, or we could shift-click multiple segments. So if I shift-clicked it, I go beep, bop, boop, beep. And now I've shift-clicked a bunch of segments. Or I could just lasso, boop, now I have all that. Oh, I lassoed the wrong direction. You have to lasso left, excuse me, you have to lasso left to right uh, to select. If you lasso right to left, that activates uh, the slip slash slide function. Um, and that's that's an editing function that we're going to get to later in this book. Um, but yeah, so direction matters when it comes to lassoing. So I'm going to lasso left to right, making sure that I'm in my timeline area. Okay, well, I'm just going to shift click, select some. Okay, now we have the segments that I want to use. And then we're going to right click the timeline and choose create sequence based on selection. So I can right click in here and we'll do create sequence, that sequence template, create sequence based on selection. And when I hit that, it's going to ask us, where would we like to store this new sequence? These are our bins, obviously. I'm gonna select this one and I'll hit OK. We'll see that new bin or that new sequence appears in our bin and prompts us by highlighting it to change the name. Um, so now we have a new sequence. If I load this in the timeline, boom, now we have a new sequence based off of our selection. Very, very easy, very fast. All right, let's keep moving. Okay. As you can see on my screen, um, any unselected segments become filler. Uh, so now we have all this extra filler in the timeline and gaps in the new sequence. So if I had selected clips here and then selected more clips down the timeline, there would just be filler in the middle if there was clips that I didn't include. Once we create a subsequence, we can feel free to edit it as we see fit. And when we're ready, we can incorporate uh, and improve the section and then come back to the larger project at hand. So super easy stuff. Uh, quick note here from Avid, a subsequence does not maintain a link to its original sequence. That means that changes to the original sequence won't appear in our subsequence and vice versa. So if I'm editing this, if I'm moving this stuff around and, and changing this up dramatically, that's not going to be reflected in my main version. Um, that's only going to be reflected here because these are treated as completely separate sequences. What is this guy? Look, look at this specimen. Wow. All right. Like many of its functions, Media Composer borrowed the multi-sequence uh, strategies described in this section from the film industry. Imagine a film editor cutting celluloid film. What if the editor had to constantly manage the entire film sequence on one reel while assembling, then trimming individual scenes? That would be a mess. And imagine doing this in the middle of the reel. That would be madness. So instead of film uh, editor with cut individually scenes and then assembling them into a complete cohesive film at the end. 
we can do the same thing in Media Composer, except we can work with unlimited copies of the clips and sequences. So we don't have to worry about handling delicate celluloid film. We can just do it all digitally here. All right, let's move on now to finding alternative shots. So at some point in the editing process while revising a sequence, you'll often find, face questions like, what else is in this shot? Are there alternative takes for this line? Is there another angle of this? Is there more coverage of this scene? or for this scene. Two functions, the match frame and the find bin, can help you answer these questions very quickly. Professional editors use these tools so often they map them to their keyboards like many functions in Media Composer. What if you want to search across multiple bins? You'll use the find tool to do this. Let's look at each really quickly here. So first we have the match frame. Match frame uses the currently displayed frame in the record monitor. So if I come over to an actual frame and not filler, um, it uses the actual frame here in our record monitor to locate and load its source clip into the source monitor. And it parks the source monitor's position indicator on that exact same frame and marks an endpoint. So to perform a match frame, we can park the position indicator over a segment in our sequence, check, and then we can activate the record sidetrack selector for that segment to ensure that we're, and disable the higher tracks. So for instance, we've got our V2 disabled, we are on our V1, Oh, sorry, we want our V2 enabled so that we have it selected on this exact shot in this exact frame. If we had more above it, we'd want to disable those um, so that we're not interfering with trying to match frame to this. And then we'll click the match frame button under the record monitor. And this is the match frame button. So I have to do a select this. This is mapped by default on your interface. So all I have to do is match frame. Boom, loads it in the source monitor, loads the exact clip from wherever it was in a bin, and sets an in mark. So now we know exactly what we're working with. If you want to preserve the source clip's original in and out marks, you can hold Alt or Option as you press the match frame button or the key that you mapped on your keyboard. Um, so let's say for instance, I came over here, if I hold uh, Option and then I click the match frame button, um, we get this little <laughs> menu. Uh, we'll get a master clip, yeah. And then our master clip, oh, this is funny. I love how I picked like the worst example. Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, but if we wanted to preserve the source clips in and out marks that we'd already set earlier, so that might have been here and then a little bit later and then there, um, we could hold alter option and then press the match frame key. Quick note here from Avid. Um, you can also perform the match frame by right clicking the track selectors and then choose match frame track. And you don't need to activate the track selectors first. So that's a quick little feature there too. All right, next is find bin. So the find bin can help you find alternative shots. And if you're not sure where you placed your sequence, uh, it can solve that mystery as well. So Media Composer finds the bin, opens it, and highlights the clip or sequence within the bin. To find the bin or the clip in the sequence, load it into the Composer window. Optionally, we could use the match frame to load the sequence or clip into the source monitor. Or we could click the reveal find uh, ref sorry, find bin button in the composer windows toolbar. So if we wanted to find bin, we could select this button. So it's going to pull up this shot in the bin, or at least it's going to pull up this sequence. For example, we have this sequence. It's telling us, oh, it's right here. This is, this is the sequence that we're in right now. Let's say I open another sequence though, and I get a completely different shot. Or let's say I come here, I use the match frame and I load a shot. So I've loaded this exact same shot in the exact same frame in my source monitor, but now I'm trying to find where this is in, in my bins. All I have to do is select it, and then all I have to do is hit find bin, and it's gonna open the correct bin that this is located in, which is empty. Could not select slip this roof all last known bin location, Tennessee Park versus. This is hilarious. I love how this is all like everything's going wrong here. Um, just didn't know. I guess I might have moved the footage. Did I? How are all of these empty? Uh, oh, they're all open here. Okay, there they are. Okay, interesting. Let's say we didn't have this bin open. We we're on a different bin, and then all I had to do was select this and then hit find bin, and it's going to open it. It's going to highlight the correct one. Super easy. <laughs> Sorry for so many errors. This is hilarious. Um, but yeah, Media Composer tries its best. If you move things around, it's going to get confused. So try and be as organized as possible from the beginning. Cool. 
Easy peasy. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, you can bypass the source monitor to open the timeline segment bin and highlight the source clip. To do this, we can place a position indicator in the segment with a seek within the sequence. Then we can activate the segments track and disable higher ones to find bin reference as at its highest active track. And then we can alter option, click the Mac record monitor, find bin. So another way we could do that. All right, let's move on now to the find tool. Finally, if you need to search your entire project for an element, you'll use the find tool. In the past, you've used search fields in the effects palette and bins. Uh, remember when we were searching up here for in our bins, remember when we were using the effects palette, we were searching for specific effects. So we know what these different search fields are like. Um, but the field, the find tool searches across all metadata in our project, regardless of which bin we're looking at. So that's super awesome um, because we don't need to make sure that we're selected on specific bins. If I'm trying to search in this effects palette or this specific mode, or if I'm in my bins, it's only going to search this bin, whereas the find tool is going to search across our entire project. Uh, it makes finding a clip super easy, even if we don't know which bin in that it's in. So to open the find tool, we can do the following. We could hit Control F or Command F on our keyboard. That's going to open it. And or we could go to Edit. And then in Edit, we can do the find tool or find. Awesome. Now that we have it open, we can do the following. As you can see on my screen here, this in the find tool includes four tabs across the top. So let's break them down slowly here. We have clips and sequences. This You're going to use this tab to search text in the bin columns. For example, we're going to look for clip names or any metadata tags that you add to custom columns. So let's say I had a shot specifically of a kid punching a water balloon and it hit a pig. I might search pig or whatever media or keywords I'm looking for that would trigger when I look for my clips inside my clips, my bins. Um, and it's going to find that information on my clips and my sequences. Um, we also have script text that's here. Let's tab over here. This uses this tab, sorry, you'll use this tab to search the text inside imported scripts. For example, lines of dialogue. Next, we have timeline and monitors. Uh, we're going to use this tab to search text displayed on segments in the timeline or in the composer window. Window, window, gee whiz, including clip names, markers, local comments, and any additional text displayed on segments. Uh, we can also, to display information beyond clip names, we could go to the timelines fast menu and choose an option in the clip text submenu. So there we have that. And then we have markers. Let's tab over to markers. And then we'll use this tab to search for text added to markers on any clip or sequence. This means the find tool can conduct a variety of searches within each tab. You'll find additional uh, options in the drop down menus to help you refine your search. Let's look at a couple of examples. So if we're searching across multiple bins, as mentioned, you can conduct a search across multiple bins uh, and then filter those results. To do this, we can type in the clips and sequences uh, field, and we're going to click in that little find area. Optionally, if we want to narrow down our search, we can choose a bin column in the filter option. So we could choose a specific column for this. Um, we don't have to. So if I was trying to search through my ins, my outs, my tape, my window, my drive, any one of these, we could we could use that to narrow down what clip we're looking for in any one of our bins, not just this bin that I'm showing now. Um, cool. So let's say I'm looking for the bike rack shot. Now I can hit enter and it's going to find shots that include bike rack in the name and or anywhere else. If this metadata was in a comment section at the end or in a different column, it would also include that information too. We have this bottom bar here we can scroll left and right with. So that makes uh, navigating in this super, super easy. What else can we do? Then we'll double click a clip and open it in the bin and that'll load it in the source monitor. So once we find a search option, we can double click our clip and we can see that it loads it in the source monitor. It's super easy. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Searching for a specific location, what if we need to find all instances of a clip in our sequence? So we can use the find tool for this, obviously. To do this, we're going to open the sequence and enable all track selectors. So we're going to make sure all our track selectors are enabled here. And that will include those in our search as well. In the find fields, timeline and monitors, we're going to select this. 
um, we're going to type the text in the search field and then click find. Um, so we could use this little find button here. I hit enter earlier, by the way. So if I want to find, um, let's say, rail. I know there's shots with rail lines in them. I could then hit find. And there is railing ram. So there's this one specific uh, shot that is in my timeline. So that's really nice. If I now, I believe if I double click it, let's see here. Um, Media Composer moves the position indicator. Oh, duh. Media Composer moves the position indicator to the near, near search result and highlights it in my find tool. So we can see that it did move it. And I can see right here, R-A-I-L. Um, this is the railing ram, whatever this says, the railing ramp inspect.sub, um, that it has moved the position indicator in my timeline to the location of that. And if I had a bunch of options in this, I could click those and that position indicator would keep jumping so I could find it specifically in my sequence. This is super, super nice if we have a sequence that for some reason, some ungodly reason is like an hour and a half long and we don't know what clip is where specifically. This is where taking the time to input metadata to name your clips is invaluable, like just cartwheel. That could save you hours could save you hours of searching for footage if you just name the clips. Like we know this one's got a cartwheel in it. It's going to be super easy to find later. Cool. Um, when you reach the last instance of the search term in our timeline, it will circle back to the beginning of the timeline and continue scanning from there. You can, quick note here, you can find the detail explanations of each find tool option in the searching for clips or sequences with text find section in the Media Composer help. So that's a resource available to you as well. All right, let's move on to selecting multiple segments. So we'll close our find tool here and keep trudging along. At some point during the editing process, you'll want to move or remove multiple timeline segments, or you'll want to open up space in the middle of a sequence. The tools covered in this next section explain how. So we're going to use segment tools to select timeline segments. The segment mode buttons at the top of the timeline palette let you quickly select multiple segments at once. So we got our segment mode tools. I'm going to set this back to a smart tool. Boom, we're right there. Turn it back on. We're ready to go. I'm going to turn off my trim type tools and we'll leave that the way it is now. Um, you use this, uh, we, or we did use this in lessons four and lesson five of the MC 101 course. So this should be semi familiar to you. I was also playing with this earlier by hitting Shift A and Shift S. That was enabling and disabling different uh, segment mode tool um, activations. But to use this tool to select multiple segments uh, in our timeline, we can click the segment and then Shift click additional segments. We were doing this earlier. So I can click this segment and I could Shift click more as we go along and I could remove these from my timeline if I wanted to. Um, this works well for selecting non-continuous segments. So if we have segments that are kind of broken up, I could turn off my link selection toggle. Right now, these are just video shots. This is a montage edited over. You know what? Let's do something real quick. Let's let's do the find bin thing. And I'm going to make a duplicate of this because I just realized I haven't done that yet. So I'll hit Command D and um, uh, I'm going to go to the end of this. I'm going to backspace and then I'm going to do, um, I don't know, I'll type tutorial. Now we have our tutorial version. Make sure that that's open. All right, now we can do that uh, segment thing. We'll select multiple segments here, holding shift. Nice. All right, so we got our multiple segments selected. Uh, we could also lasso a group of segments. To create the lasso, we'll click the space above the top video track and we'll drag the pointer down and to the right or hold alt or option as we drag to create a lasso directly in the timeline. Um, lasso, quick note here that the lasso must completely surround a segment to select it. Otherwise, it's not going to uh, select as much as you're looking for. All right, and then if we want to remove them, we could just hit delete on a keyboard and that's going to, by default, that's going to lift them. It's not going to extract them. If we extracted them, they would snap shut and everything would be gone. But if I hit delete or backspace on my keyboard, that's going to automatically uh, remove them. Awesome. All right, let's move on to using the multiple segment selection tools. So you can also use multiple segment selection tools to select a group of clips. You mapped this during the lesson four um, exercises and you explored how to use them in the MC 101 course. Let's review them um, and we're going to complete this following match activity now.
Remember these bad boys? All right, I'll give you a second to look this over. Make sure you match them correctly. Okay, all right, we're back. So number one, which one is this one? B, obviously, select segments under the position indicator and to the left on active tracks. What about number two? Yep, that's obviously C. Select segments under the position indicator to the right on active tracks. And then C is obviously going to be A. Selects all the segments between the in and out marks on active tracks. Did you get it right? I hope you did. Maybe you didn't. That's fine. Not really. Let's keep moving. Regardless of how you select multiple segments, you can either move or remove them by using the extract slash splice in tool yellow, or to, that would be to close the gap, or you can live, use the lift or overwrite tool in red, and that's going to leave a gap. All right. So we have options for that too. Let's, uh, let's keep moving. So let's move on to technique. Give yourself space to work. That's what Abbott calls it. What if you completed most of your rough cut but find that you need to add content to the middle of the sequence? Depending on the sequence's structure, you might find it easiest to open some space before revising that portion of the edit. When done, you can just easily rejoin the sequence segments together. Here's how you could do that. So we'll place the position indicator where we want to create a gap and activate, a spe activate these specific tracks. So we want to we wanna edit right in the middle here. We're going to pop our position indicator. I'm going to hit G. Uh, I'm going to deselect. I'm going to hold Command to snap to that specific frame. Um, we're going to place the position indicator here that we want to create our gap. And then we're going to um, click the Select Right button that we mapped on our timeline palette or keyboard. And we do not have that mapped. So let's map that now. I'm going to hit Command-3. That's going to open our Command Palette or Control-3 if you're on Windows. And then we're going to look for an empty space here in our timeline uh, menu. So let's go to, we're looking for that select to the left of, select to the right of, there we are, to the left and to the right. So we're going to pop these right here in our little area. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to make a space in between them. Excuse me. I'm going to put the select in and out in the middle in between them. And then I'm going to put the one select to the right over here. Cool. So now we have those three options. We have select to the left, select in and out, select to the right. Let's do that. All right, I'm going to close this now. So now we're all set up. So now we can click the select to the right button that we mapped. We're going to select to the right. Boom on all our active tracks. Um, tell you what, I'm going to disable my, my audio tracks because I want to add uh, more to the middle. Next thing we're going to do is we are going to, uh, with the lift and overwrite tool selected, we're going to drag the segments to the right. So all we have to do is make sure, well, right now we're set up on our segment mode smart tool. Um, so all we have to do is make sure that we hover to the top half um, when it turns red, and then we can just click it and drag it to the left. Um, and that's super, super simple. And then I can let go. Now we've made this lovely gap in the middle where we could add more shots if we want to. If later we're done with this and we're like, oh, I want to close this gap now, I could click and then shift click all these segments to bring them back. I could alternatively drag select and select them, and then I could do the exact same thing, lift, and I could bring it back and close that gap later. I wanted to and not accidentally make a v2 track okay so we have options we have options there so i'm going to close that now because i don't need that open so that is how you would do that quickly and efficiently 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 once you finish performing additional edits into the gap you can close it to do this again we would do what i just showed you how to um, quick note here you can also exclude filler from the segment mode tool selection to do this we can open the timeline settings and click the edit tab and then deselect the select filler with the segment tool checkbox. So if we had filler gaps in here already that we didn't want to select, we could um, we could go into the settings and remove that as well. All right. With that, we are actually finished. That wraps up the rest of Lesson 5. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to get into Avid Media Composer yourself. Complete those exercises. Familiarize yourself with the program. To my students, I will see you in class. And to my YouTube viewers, like, comment, subscribe. Bye-bye.